You rem- on my own, one, two, ten, twelve. Can you remember last night, one of the things that I said, that I felt the Lord was saying, was that, that today was going to be a day of answers. Can you remember that, people? It's going to be a day of answers. And the Lord was not only was the Lord going to answer the questions that you have consciously asked, but he was going to be answering questions that you don't even know you've asked. Because that's the way he does it. The Bible says, before you call, I will answer. He's always previous as our God. He goes ahead of us every step of the way, doesn't he? We love him because he first loved us. He's previous. That's a, that's a chosenism. Chosen says that God is always previous. And, uh, and so he, he went ahead of us today. So whatever is happening in the spirit, in this place today, we are assured and we are confident that our God has gone before us. And he's made the way. So whatever happens, as Mo said earlier, you know, forget, forget how it looks to people. It, may, it matters not a jot, does it? it? Matters not a jot, people. The Lord looks on our heart, and that's what matters. So, Father, Father, we just come before you today, Lord. We thank you for this morning, God. Oh, Father, I just say thank you. Thank you for what you have begun. Lord, thank you for the journey that you're taking us on today. Thank you, Father, for the shaking of the tree, of the family tree, Lord. Thank you for that carpet of leaves, Lord, that that you have prepared for us to dance on later. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Sarah's word this morning, Lord. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, just continue. Father, we just say you are, Father, free in here. You are as free, as free as a bird, Father. Just come do what you want to do, Lord. Release my mouth, Father, just to say what you would have me to say, God, so I don't go off on one. You know what I'm like. So, Lord, I just say thank you. And I release it all over to you in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen, people. Oh, amen, she says. Bless God. Uh, Do you know, can I have a glass, please? I don't like drinking from a bottle. Thank you. Yes. Well, I keep trying to convince people of that, but nobody's following my... I come from a place where... what, What do you say, Roz? I come from a place about the mugs. Yeah, that's right. I come from a place where all the mugs come from. That's the potteries. What was that? You tell me. Say no more. Come on, this is stoke people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come on. And all the stoke he said. Hey. <laughs> oh, bless Jesus. Hey, we're a blessed people, aren't we? So, so, so you Rougeites are really blessed to have us amongst you, aren't you? <laughs> Bless God. Okay, so let's get on with the word. Can you remember last night, <clears throat> for those who weren't here, I gave you two little acronyms for fear. And I'll just start with them, just in case you've forgotten, and those who weren't here. Two little acronyms. One was very negative, and the other was very positive. Are we all settled? Are we all settled? Yeah? Okay, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of stuff going on. Are we settled? Okay. So the first acronym was, the negative one, was forget everything and run. Can you remember that? And the positive one was, who can remember what the positive one was? 
face everything and rise. Oh, yes, that's what we want, isn't it? We want to face everything and rise. That's the way the Lord wants us to live. That's what we were hearing this morning. Face everything and rise. So, just a very quick recap, two-minute recap um, on last night. Just for the sake of those who weren't here, we went over to Proverbs 28 and verse 1. That's where I begun last night. And with that scripture, it said there that the wicked flee when no one is pursuing them, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And so with that scripture, what I tried, attempted to do, I don't know how, to what degree I succeeded, but I tried to, um, to extract from that scripture um, the understanding of what the core fear of humanity is really. And we saw that the core fear was one of uh, a fear of punishment, a fear of judicial punishment and judgment because the wicked live in a state of fear and they live in a state, the wicked being those who are not yet reconciled to God and that they live in this state of fear because the sin isn't dealt with yet. Transgression isn't dealt with. They've still got a dirty conscience and only the blood of Jesus can clear the conscience and so with a dirty conscience, with an unclean conscience, in the subterranean deep, if you like, have you been? There's all of this fear that's going on. We called it like a mama fear that spawns all those other fears. And there's this sort of um, core fear, mama fear. Fear of punishment. Fear of this judicial thing that's, that's, that's ahead of us because we're not right with God. And, uh, and we saw how in the cross... Our love, what did our lovely Jesus do? Come on, let's all say it together. He blew up the mothership, didn't he? That's what we saw yesterday. We saw that this core fear was like a mothership. And then he blew the whole thing to smithereens. Oh, bless our lovely God. So that means you and I, if we have received Jesus Christ and our conscience has been cleansed, I am no longer guilty. The verdict over my life is innocent, blameless, faultless. Before the throne, I come boldly now before the throne. The righteous are bold as a lion. Oh, aren't we? That's what the word says. So we come boldly before the throne, which means that you and I, as I said last night, we're just repeating, that you and I, therefore, are no longer a legitimate host for fear. So if the mothership's been blown to pieces, you're no longer this uh, feeding trough for fear. So when it knocks at your door, you can rightfully and legitimately tell it to sling your took. You can do that with the authority that we heard about this morning. Is the blood of Jesus on your life, then you've got the authority behind the one who shed that blood, the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen, people. So, in Christ... We're not guilty. The mothership's blown up. The Bible says now there is no condemnation. Now. This time tomorrow, that scripture will say the same thing. In your tomorrows now, it'll say the same thing. Now there is no more condemnation. This time next week, it'll be the same. Now there is no, every now moment. We've got a lot of now moments to live, haven't we, before we go home. Every one of those now moments, it says, now there's no condemnation. Oh, get that in the spirits, people, we're guilt-free. Isn't that marvellous? Now there's no condemnation. When I'm a crotchety old 80-year-old woman, you know, walking down, now there's no condemnation. Bless God. When I'm taking my last breath, now there's no condemnation. No more guilt. You know, the mother fee has been smashed to smithereens, people. So, yet still, as we heard from Sarah this morning, all that's wonderful. But, oh, why does it always have to be a but? But, we know that yet still, despite all of that, we still experience fear. It's quite amazing, really. I think our lovely God, you know, shakes his head and, oh, when are they going to get it? You know? Fear comes knocking, doesn't it? The dastardly fiend. You know, censorship on your life. It wants to censor you. 
to constrain you, to imprison you, to hold you down, to hold you back. And honestly, the Lord said to me a while ago, I mean, I know he said to many people, but he really came and visited me with a personal, there's no time left because I'm coming back. I'm coming back soon. There's no time to be held down and held back. There's no time to lie, to um, hide your light under a bushel. There's no, just no time left for it. Just no time. Bless our lovely Jesus. Another time the Lord, um, some of you have heard me uh, say this before, but it's okay, repeating stuff is okay. Um, the Lord showed me the, how the enemy has a sword. And the sword of the enemy is not spelt the way we spell it. It's S-O-R-D. Can anybody remember me telling you this in times gone by? And that, again, another little acronym. And the Lord showed me sword, S. He comes to suppress. O, he comes to oppress. R, he comes to repress. D, he comes to depress. The tip of his sword is like a, ne it's like a negative press against your life. This negative press, and it always involves fear on some level. Bless our Jesus, eh? But we know who's on our side. If God is for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in me than that sword that is in the world. So I want to today uh, minister on 1 John 4 and verse 18. Who can tell me what that is without looking? Come on. 1 John 4, 18. I can see you looking, Lizzie. <laughs> 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Let's go there, shall we? And just let's see it with our own eyes. Good to see things with your own eyes, isn't it? That's what God given us for, actually. One John 4 and verse 18, then. This is my scripture for today. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. I'm just going to read it one more time. Let's just get that word out in the atmosphere. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Shall we, can we all say it together? Can, it, can, can this scripture just um, leave the, the, the mouth of every, every one of us in here? Let's, let's hear ourselves saying it together. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Hallelujah. So the first, the first line there, let me just take it a bit at a time. The first bit here, no fear in love. That's pretty um, definitive, isn't it? That's pretty emphatic. Whichever way you look at that statement, whichever way you try and get into it, it says the same. You know, you can get the Greek and the Hebrew out and all of this other stuff, but it won't say anything different. It says just that. There is no fear in love. It's, you know, there's, um, there's, no, um, there's no debate on that. The Lord hasn't left it open for debate. Ah, oh, but. There is no ah, oh, but. This is just the way it is. And there is no argument on that. There is nothing for us to come back on. There is no fear in love. We've heard last night and again this morning, but I'll say it again, the first time that fear hit the human equation, became a part of the human equation, was when Adam and Eve acted outside the, the sphere of love. How did they act outside the sphere of love? What did they do? They disobeyed a direct command. The Lord commanded. And they, and they completely stepped over the line and refused to 
to obey that command. And, and you know, the Lord has commands in New Testament. Jesus says in John 14, didn't he? He said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. That's what he said. If you love me, you'll obey. So, well, you know, staying within the sphere of the love of God is really quite contingent on doing what you know to do or not doing what you know not to do. Because obedience isn't always just about doing. Obedience is about not doing, isn't it? You know. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so fear, the first time it hit, it hit humanity, was there in the garden when they, when they did what they did. I always say, you know, that um, Adam and Eve don't have their initials, A and E, for no good reason. <laughs> They are the A and E of the Bible, aren't they? <laughs> they are, aren't they? Accident and emergency, just in case you didn't get it. So, <laughs> oh, and they laughed. So. <clears throat> So what immediately emerges after they've stepped outside of the realm of love is what I've written down here. I was trying to think of a way to describe it, and the, these are the only words that came to me. What emerged after that stepping outside of the sphere of our God's beautiful love was this grotesque, unholy, Trinitarian, false God. There was like a... It was like a counterfeit, unholy trinity that appeared. That was sin, fear, shame. It's like an unholy trinity. And at the feet of sin, fear, and shame, mankind was now groveling. <laughs> False God. Tyrant master, as I said yesterday, fear is a tyrant master. And there we were, a humanity that was made for the glory of God, bowing down to this false trinity, fear, shame, sin, fear, and shame. So here's the bottom line then. Fear can only exist outside of the sphere of God's law. Listen to that, people. That's powerful. Fear can therefore only exist outside of the sphere of God's law. Because there's no fear in law. This is God's law. There's no fear there. So its only place of existence is outside of that sphere. So when we experience fear, what we have to realize is that somewhere in that experience of fear, I am disconnected somehow with the knowledge of his love. There's a disconnect that's happened somewhere. And we have to get to the root of the disconnect. Where, where was I disconnected? What, what is it? Where's, where's that break? Where's that fracture? What's happened? Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes we just, need, we just need a little word from the Lord, just a little word of knowledge just to show us. Have you ever had those words of knowledge? I've had many of those words at various times in my life where the Lord has just pointed to something. Just pointed to something. I remember after my mother died, uh, she died when I was 10 years old. And, um, and the Lord got to dealing with the pain in my, and the fear, lots of fear. When I was, I was sort of in my uh, early 30s at this point. And, um, and the Lord began to show me the fear that was in my heart. Being orphaned from my mum, from a 10-year-old, as a 10-year-old. I never realized I had that until I'd become a Christian. And the Lord began to deal with it, and here's what he said to me. It's like, you just need a little word sometimes. And I believe those words are here today for you. And the Lord said this to me, Christine. He said, Satan may have robbed you of the channel of mother's love, but he could never rob you of the source. For I am the source of mother's love. And what prior to that was like, was like a, you know, an umbilical cord that was just floundering around with no connection. After that word, I found the Lord connected that umbilical cord and healed my heart. All those years of fear and loss, you know, and the Lord healed my heart. Bless our Jesus. 
So fear can only exist outside the sphere of God's love. Fear is a foreign body to God's love. It's a foreign body, it's like a splinter. A splinter gets caught in you, you know. That's like fear. When fear attempts to, to uh, encompass you, you know, to, when it's knocking at your door, see it like a splinter trying to puncture your relationship with God, your love relationship with God. Well, what happens in the natural when, this, when a foreign body gets into, into your system? There's an immune system, isn't there, that raises it up to expel it. Listen, love has an immune system. God's love has a powerful immune system and he's called the Holy Spirit. You know, when that thing, when that fear attempts to puncture, immediately the Holy Spirit, you know, gets into action to remove the thing, to expel it. He'll create a conference for you like this, maybe. The Holy Spirit at work, the immune system of God's love, wanting to pull out the splinters, you know. Or he'll do something, whatever. But the Holy Spirit begins to rise up when he can see, whoa, these things attempting foreign bodies. Fear is a foreign body to love people. And uh, love, I've written down here, love is fear intolerant. There's no room for fear in love. And it is not tolerant of fear in any way. Bless God. So when we look at the next line of this scripture, what have we got here? There is no fear in love. Let's just be aware that what we're saying here, we're not saying that perfect love is casting out fear out of love. We're saying that perfect love is casting out fear of the heart that love has come to indwell. Yeah. Yes. Are we all in agreement? Oh, yes. Well, I'm... Well, I'm carrying on anyway, whether you are or not, to be honest. <laughs> you know I love you, don't you? So perfect love casts out fear. I'm going to say perfect love. We're going to look at that uh, in a little while, but I just want to go through the other bits first. So it casts out fear. This thing called perfect love casts out fear. The word cast here is a violent word. Oh, it's full of violence, and I love it. Not violence. I love the fact that, that this word is full of violence. It casts out fear. Let me tell you what it means. It means to violently throw with force, to smite or buff it. It means to slap, slap about the face. Strike, repeatedly strike. You dog, you. Come on. That's what it means. It means to force away by pushing through the crowd. It means to like throw away and not care where the thing lands. Well, what does that say? It's got no value. Anything that you, anything that you throw aside and you, haven't, and you don't care where it lands tells me that you have no, um, that that thing has no value at all to you. As far as perfect love is concerned, there is no value whatsoever in fear. There's none. It tosses it aside after it slapped it around a few times. Ooh, after it, after it slapped it around a few times. And it cares not where it lands. I get a sense, and I don't know if I'm using a bit of poetic license here by connecting the two, but if, it's, if I am, it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't really matter, no. As long as it's truth, as long as there's truth in it, that's what matters. Could somebody shut that door, please, for me, so we're not getting the clanks of the... Oh, was it? Oh, well, I off them. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I think there's a connection here with Matthew 11, where it talks about um, the kingdom of God suffering violence. And then it says, the violent take it by force. Do you know that scripture? The Bible talks about somebody, a body of people called the violent I wouldn't like to be described as the violent, really, would you? But there is a people called the violent, and the violent take the kingdom of God by force. Well, here's what I think. I think perfect love is the violent. Perfect love violently casts out fear. When you think about that, well, that, that um, 
those two words again, perfect love, add on the violent, perfect love, the violent. That's what it is. Perfect love, the violent, takes the kingdom by force. It takes the kingdom by force by violently removing fear. That's what it does, people. How marvelous is that? I've said, I've said a couple of times now, and you need to hear, fear really is, it's a tyrant master. And it treats your life without mercy. It is mercy-less. Remember, we, we use the scripture in Romans 8, for you have not received a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, telling us that fear is an orphan spirit. It knows nothing of the love of a mother, the love of a father. It's an awe. It has no mercy, no compassion, no anything. And it treats you mercilessly. We want nothing to do with the stuff, do we, people? It treats you badly. It treats you wrong. It abuses you. <clears throat> The good news, the good news is that perfect love, the violent, turns the tables. And when perfect love, the violent, comes in, guess what? It shows mercy. It shows fear, no mercy. It shows fear, no mercy. Oh, isn't that marvelous? You've got a, per you've got a love on the inside of you. That love that is greater than anything this planet has ever seen on the inside of you that shows every fear that comes knocking at your door, no mercy. And what we have to do is get with the program of perfect love. We've got to get with that program. Come out of our own program and stop showing it mercy. When fear comes knocking at our door all too often, we say, oh, come in, do you want a cup of tea? It says it's like, it's like, mis, it's like misdirected co uh, compassion, isn't it? Fear comes knocking at me, don't want to feel obliged to worry. <laughs> if I don't worry, you never know what's going to happen, do you? Well, we do, don't we? How many sugars do you have? <laughs> it is, isn't it? We've got to get with heaven's program. No mercy, no mercy, no pity. When the Lord, when the Lord, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the first chapter of, jo uh, well, throughout the, the book of Joshua, and, uh, and the Lord is sending him off out now to go and possess the land. And what does he say to him? He says to him repeatedly, don't you show them heights any mercy. Wipe them off the face of the earth. This is our God whose mercy is in you every morning. It's quite an alarming thing to hear our God say that. Don't you show them any mercy? Wipe them off the face of the earth, he says. Our God, our lovely, merciful God. Why? Why is he so without pity when it comes to fear? We're going to have a look at that in a little while. But why? Because the whole, the whole, these whole, um, these ites were diseased with fear. They carried the spirit of the world the spirit of the world that is undergirded with this vile stuff called fear. So our Lord saying, no mercy, no mercy, no mercy. Would you like to turn with me to Hosea 13 and verse 14? <coughs> Hosea, Joel. Hosea 13 and verse 14. And one or two have heard me use this scripture before, but again, it doesn't matter because it's so powerful. It's good to hear things again and again, isn't it? Okay, listen to this. Um, Hosea 13, and this is on the subject of no mercy. This is showing our God who has no mercy when it comes to this whole uh, area of fear and every offshoot of fear and every expression of fear. Listen to this. He says this, this is God now just speaking out into the atmosphere through the prophet. He says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. Hallelujah, bless Jesus. I will redeem them from death. He's sending that out into the atmosphere. And then look what he does. Oh, we love it, we love it. 
He turns around and then speaks to it, eyeball to eyeball, face to face, and he says this, Oh, death, I will be your plagues. Oh, grave, I will be your destruction, and pity is hidden from me. Who's speaking? God is speaking. God is love. This is love speaking, people. This is love. Love says to, love says to death, oh death, I will be your plagues. Love is death's plague. How, how can you get that to sink into, into your spirit? Love is death's plague. Love is, is the grave's destruction. Do you think that's powerful, people? Is, that, do, is it just me who thinks that? It is powerful, isn't it? And pity is hidden from my eyes. I just have this picture of our lovely Jesus and all of his victorious splendor. I see him like that. Speaking to death. Speaking to the grave. I, me, Jesus, God, Yahweh, Yeshua, Jesus. I, me, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I will be your plague. I will be your destruction, oh fear. Do you know the only thing that fear is afraid of is love. It's the only thing it's afraid of, people. Have I got time? Yes. Yes, we have. We didn't put down dinner till one, did we? <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, some of you again have heard this, but okay. Um, I had, um, let me tell you about my experience with fear. Spirit of fear. When I got born again, because this is still in relation to no mercy, because um, I really want you to get that in your spirit, that when we leave this conference and fear comes knocking at your door, remember, no mercy, no mercy, no pity. You're out of tea bags. <laughs> or sugar, whatever you want. So after I became a Christian, not long after I became a Christian, I suddenly started to get very fearful living in my house. As soon as, soon as the sort of, it got a bit dusk, the fear began to, to set in. So much so, and as, was, who, was, who was saying at some point, was it me? You know, the, the, the experiences that we can have, oh, surely actually, the experiences that you can have, those demonic experiences, we've had, I don't know, you know, who in here has had these kind of things happen, but I've had some horrific, horrendous stuff go on uh, in those early days anyway. And, uh, and so much so that I would be paralyzed, literally paralyzed, I'd go to bed. And I'd be, I, was, I was laying on my back in bed like this. I did hardly dare breathe. I was so paralyzed with fear. Just to make a move of my body, it was like really scary. The panic and the fear. And it was a, a real devilish, spooky fear, like a, you know, as though my room was full of ghosts and that, that sort of haunted kind of fear. And then all kinds of experiences, you know, like these, whatever you want to call them, laying on me and I, hear, I, I wrote my testimony, uh, I put my testimony down in song when I got born again, and the words were, um, one life in a million pieces, impossible to restore. One life completely shattered beyond repair, or so I thought. Wanting to die, yet wanting to live. Confusion and pain all around, seeing no way out until I heard you call my name out loud, and you said, look and see all the pieces I hold in my hand. You said, come to me, I'll make you whole again. And, uh, you know, one particular, like this demonic force was, I heard it, it was singing this song, singing it in, in, with all this thrash metal and this demonic voice singing this song. So I had some really bad experiences, paralyzed with fear. In the end, I told our pastor, told the pastor and him and the elder came down and they bought the oil and they went through the house and they prayed the name and the blood of Jesus so that my house was just like that, those homes back in Exodus, you know, when they put the blood over them. That was my house. Oh, and did love come to live in my house? Oh, it did. Oh, I was saturated, people. Saturated, soaked. 
I was soaked to the core in love. Oh, I was getting up every day. The love of God was just flooding me. I was all, oh, oh, God, God. It was most wonderful. A real physical, physical uh, experience of the love of God for three days. <laughs> There's always a button. For three days. And uh, after three days, I went to, I went to bed. And I can only describe this as as an experience in the spirit. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and I'm sure that's not, I don't know how accurate it, that, that statement is, but that's the only words I've got to describe it. I was awoken, and I was awoken. I didn't just wake up, I was awoken. Um, probably about two, three o'clock in the morning. And I got out of bed. When I say I got out of bed, I think it was my spirit got out of bed. I can't describe it, I can't sort of articulate it um, well enough for you. So I got out of bed anyway and and I went to my bedroom window and standing outside of my garden, outside of the, you know, the fence, the wall, was this figure and it was a very dark figure. It was a man, very dark, got this big black hat thing on and he was looking up at me in the bedroom window, so full of intimidation. And I stood there looking at this thing. And suddenly, I was so angry, I thought my head was going to blow off. I just had three days saturated in intense love. Oh, the love of God was just so fair. I, whoa, this anger. What I'm telling you is I believe this was the, this was the righteous anger that comes out of this no mercy no pity. And I saw this thing and I knew it was a spirit of fear and I knew that this thing was what had been intimidating me, paralyzing me for all these months. And I was so angry. It was like, how dare this thing come come back? The blood of Jesus is all over my house. How dare it come to knock at my house? Well, all the blood of Jesus. And I went, I got out of bed. Oh, I was already out of bed, sorry. I went out to my bedroom, I went down the stairs, I flung open my front door, I marched out of the front door, I went out of the gate, and this spirit of fear was here, this, this demonic thing, and I'm here, and I'm going to this thing. In the name of Jesus, you will leave me alone. This is the end, no more. And this fear that was here all suddenly went. So I, it went like that, and then began to, to, to go like this and run. And so I continued to chase it. Let me get back to where I was. So I began to chase it, and I'm like this all the way. In the name of Jesus. And it was, in the name of Jesus. And I chased this thing, because I lived at the bottom of a hill. I chased it up to the top of this bank. And then it turned a corner, so I lost sight of it for a minute. And so I continued round the corner. And when I got round the corner, it was sitting on a chair. I don't know where the chair came from. But it was sitting on a chair, and it was like this. It was withered. It was like... It was an old man. Not old as we know old. No. It was old. Like it was thousands of years old. Like it was millions of years old, actually. It was just as older than I've ever seen anything. And it was all... And I want you to know that's the power that we have in us. This is what perfect love does. It disempowers fear if we'll access it. In Jesus' name. So then, perfect love casts out fear. The next line says, 
Are you all okay? Yes. <clears throat> so the next line says, fear, because fear has torment. So this next line tells us why perfect love casts out fear. Gives us a reason why. God doesn't always tell us why, you know. Have you ever noticed that sometimes in your life? How many times do you ask God why? Have you asked him? Oh, there's so many situations in your life, aren't there? You say, why, God? Why? You know, and he doesn't always answer the whys. And when he doesn't answer the whys, you've just got to trust him, haven't you? So, but he does answer the why here. That's if you did have a why. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And this word torment, again, goes back to the mothership because this word torment means um, punishment, condemnation, guilt, condemnation, the fear of all of that punishment and judgment. So perfect love casts out fear because fear has all of this contained in it. Like we said last night, fear has contained in it. The, you know, the, the, the fear of torment and punishment and judgment. This is the mother fear. This is the mothership. And this little word, hath, you wouldn't think, would you, that this little word could have such a meaning. A little word, hath. And that's in the old King James. Fear, hath. And this word, hath, means this. It means it holds as a possession. Fear holds as a possession. Fear holds within it as a possession. Punishment, condemnation, judgment. It's got all of that yuck in it. And it goes on to mean it has the means to accomplish its task. So he is the, he is the incredible truth, people. That fear, perfect love, casts out fear because... Fear, via the construct of your mind, has the means to simulate within you the slave status all over again. Shall I say that again? It has the means, because it is in possession of, of judgment and punishment and all of that stuff, if I let it in, it has the means to simulate. It's not a real thing, but it has the means to simulate if I open up this to it, it can simulate within us that slave status again. It can reconstruct the mothership, the mothership up here. The Lord knows that. So he casts out, perfect love casts out fear because fear holds as its possession and has the means to accomplish the simulating of the slave status within us again. You know, how many, how many Christians do you know? Maybe you were one of them. I was, certainly was for a long time. Christian born again. And yet your mind, you know, is taken up with all sorts of ridiculous issues. You know, torment, like you say, fear and all sorts of stuff. You know, because it holds it within its possession. So let's have a look at perfect love then. What is this thing called perfect love? Because it's obviously very powerful stuff. Perfect love. Now, just let me note, note here, people, it does not say, it doesn't say love casts out fear. Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, it doesn't say love. It doesn't say love per se. It's not love per se, love, love, love. It's not love that casts out fear, people. It's perfect love. Ah, this is a key. This is a real key for us. What is perfect love? Let's have a little look. Perfect love is love in relationship. So perfect love, this word perfect actually means mature love. It means love that is full of age. 
love that is fully grown in power and in character. So it's a mature love. Mature love. Love in relationship with God that has, that has, that has matured, that has grown, that has developed. This love casts out fear. Love in relationship. Isn't that marvelous? Love independently of me is not going to put fear out. This is, this is really quite important, isn't it? It's not going to do it. Love independently of me. No, love is going to do that in a mature relationship with me. So what that says to me is, it's important to grow in the love of God, isn't it? This is important. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says faith, talks about faith, hope and love. And what does it say? Of all these three, love. Love is the most important. It's vital that we put our roots down in love. If we want to live a fearless life, we've got to go down deep in the love of God. Because together, him loving me, me loving him, that response again is what we've heard today. Oh, this mutual thing that goes on. Look at that. God loving me, me loving God, growing in this love. This is what's going to put out. This is what's going to violently slap around the face. Fear and put it out. Perfect love, the violent. That's what we become a part of. As we go deep in the roots of, of God's love. Perfect love, the violent. I'm not putting fear out. Perfect love's putting it out. This relationship, this relationship is putting it out. This relationship in and of itself is doing it. I just have to get on with the relationship. I just have to love, don't I? Lord, take me deeper. Take me deeper, Father. Paul says, oh, that you would be rooted, rooted deep in the love of God that you might know the length, the breadth, the depth, the width, the height. Bless Jesus. How do we put down roots? I've nearly finished, people. How do we put down roots? It's ever so simple, isn't it? It is simple. One of the things the Bible says to do, if we want to grow in the love of God, is to love one another. <laughs> How do I put my roots down in, in this incredible love? I love? We love one another. Lizzie's having me stay at her house tonight. So I don't have to drive back to Stoke. She's loving me. In that one act, she has gone down deeper in the love of God. In this one act, she's got one less fear to contend with. Just by having me stay at her house tonight. Can't go any simpler than that, can you? Love one another. How else do we root down in the love of God? The scripture, um, just before uh, one, this one, John 4, 18, it might be verse 17 or a bit before, I'm not sure, says this, that the apostle said this, we have known and believed the love. We believe the love. How do we root down? We've got to believe. Believe the love, not just believe in an abstract way. We've got to believe the love, believe it, you know. I don't know about you, but all too often in my own world, you know, when I get into trouble, it really is because I haven't believed the love. I haven't believed it, you know. And I go off on a tangent trying to sort it myself because I haven't believed the love. This is how we root down. We say no. Well, when Jesus was asked, what is the work of God? His response was what? Oh, only believe. Only believe what? Only believe what? Believe the love. Believe that the Father loves you. That was the whole point that he came. That was the whole reason he came. To introduce you to the Father. This Father who loved us. Amen. Is this heaven saying, enough now, Christine, shut up. Is it my phone? Oh, no. Thanks for that, Sarah. <laughs> you could have told me later. Yeah, so take it, put it in. The, no, Mo, take me back, Ducky, if you will. I'm just put it in the kitchen. And, 
if you don't mind. Kate, will you sort it for me? Me, me go. <laughs> yeah, it's the Lord, isn't it? It's the Lord, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Just saying, keep going, Chris. You're doing a good job. Come on. So, so we believe the love. I've nearly finished, like I said. We believe the love. And we trust, we've got to actively trust, haven't we? I've got situations going on at the moment where I am really actively, in every sense of the word, having to trust God. Because if I don't, my heart would be broken to over and over. There's a situation where my heart would just break. I've got to trust the Lord. I've got to trust this love. I've got to trust it. I've got to actively trust it. This love has told me what not to do in this situation. And everything in me wants to do the opposite. I want to do the opposite. Every instinct in me is to do the opposite. But this love has said, no, don't do that. Hold on. And uh, so I've got to trust in not doing what I want to do. I'm trusting. Trusting the love. This is how we go deeper. Every day that I don't do what what is my instinct to do, I'm going deeper. I'm going deeper. I'm going deeper. And those fears are diminishing. In Jesus' name. So, so people, I've just got one more scripture for us. But I'm just going to say this. If mature love casts out fear, what does immature love do? That's a question, isn't it? And a valid one. If mature love casts out fear, what does immature love do? Well, it gets duped. It gets deceived. It opens up the door and says, come in. Do you want a cup of tea like we've already said? How many sugars? Or would you prefer coffee? Would you like a chocolate while you're at it? That's what immature love does, doesn't it? It makes a friend of fear. Because he's scared not to. And it really is quite loath to let it go. Let me tell you one of the reasons why it's loath to let it go. And I did share this at the last conference. Because, um, because... Fear is a belief. It is, isn't it? It's a belief. It's something you've believed. That, that, um, that other acronym that we talked about, false evidence appearing real, it's something that you've believed. And our belief system is what we believe is precious to us. It's taken you all of your life. Where, how many years have you been on planet Earth? It's taken all those years to get you to this point with the belief systems that you've got. You've invested your whole life into what you believe. And so, and so, you know, when someone comes along, you know, and tells you what you believed isn't so, it's not, you know, there's, a, there's, there's often a reaction, isn't there? And so immature love, immature love is quite loath to say, no, 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 I believe this. I shared at the last conference, if you remember, when I had, a, you know, I had a, a, quite a violent father. And, um, and this woman came to me out of the blue, didn't know if you remember me sharing. And she said to me, you must forgive your father. I want you to punch your wife. <laughs> I really did. I was like, who do you, because when you, when you, when you are, when you sort of live un, under that sort of bullyish kind of, you know, and it's your dad. Be, you know, your dad is a deity. My dad, anyway, was a deity to me. I believed every word he said. So when he told me I was useless and hopeless and all these other things, I believed every word he said. And so this was my belief system that I was, you know, like I said to you last time, like that Blackpool sticker rock, made and wrong, made and wrong, made and wrong, made and wrong. And so when this woman comes along and says, you've got to forgive your father, it was horrific to me. It was like, no, he's got to forgive me. I'm made and wrong. I've got to work out a way of not being made and wrong so he'll like me. And you see, what what, what a terrible, I was duped, immature love. I'd been duped. But the Lord sorted it in the end. So, final scripture. Um, 1 Corinthians 2. I've no idea how long I've been going for. But it's not Sunday church, is it? So it doesn't matter. Woo! <laughs> I slapped my thigh. Okay. 1 Corinthians 2. See, I can even say that because it's not. I slap my thigh, people. I slap my thigh. Bless God, eh? 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 and 7 says this. However, 
we speak wisdom among those who are who are mature yet not the wisdom of this age those I couldn't see yet not the wisdom of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now, maturity in God is not about your biological age. It's not about how many years you've been as a Christian. It's how deeply you're rooted in the love of God. And when you're rooted deep in the love of God, what happens? Paul says, oh, you're able to absorb wisdom. The deeper we go in those roots of his love, I'm, I'm, I'm more open to hear the wisdom that comes from heaven. I can absorb the wisdom. What's happening when I'm absorbing wisdom from heaven? Oh, my mind is being changed. I'm getting the mind of Christ. And what happens when I start getting the mind of Christ? When that dirty, dastardly fiend, that fear comes along with a big lollipop in its hand, I tell it sling it soup. Because I'm on to his game. I know what he's after. I'm not like a, um, a, a little child anymore who can be just taken astray because there's a lollipop being held out to me or a bag of sweets. Do you see that? Because I've got the mind of Christ. Oh, most wonderful, most wonderful. Jesus said in John 10, my sheep will not go off with a stranger. Who's the stranger? Fear. He comes disguised in many ways, but my sheep won't go off with him. He says, under no way will they go off with him. So, definitely ending now. She says, with a glint in her eye. But I am. Just a couple of little thoughts on the love that we are to root down deep in. To live a fearless life. Just let me just tell you a couple of things. This love is all together. I'm probably telling you what you already know, but that's okay. It's all together lovely. This love is altogether otherly. 1 John 3 verse 1, the Weiss translation says, What foreign to the human heart love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called bairns of God. What foreign to the human heart love. This love is the original love. This love originates beyond the inside of this world. This is what you're to be rooting down in. We've all got love on a lateral level that can be an expression of this love. But this original love originates from the outside of this world. But foreign to the human heart love. Absolutely. This is the love that, before the foundation of the world, conceptualized you. Oh, before the foundation of the world, he thought you up. This love thought you up. It took the palate of our lovely Jesus and decided what colours you personally would have. He conceptualised you, he thought you up. He carried you in his eternal womb until such time as there was a body prepared for you. You've heard me say it, people, haven't you, many times? Our father in the eternities was like a big pregnant mama carrying his beautiful, wonderful humanity until a time came when there was a body prepared for you. And in that moment, he released you into that body. This is the original love, people. And then he stayed with you when you were in the womb. And when you were in the womb, when he, when he put you in the womb, people, he didn't just leave you and say, well, ta-ta, have a nice journey now. When he released you into the world, what did he do? He put a little back, he put it like a little backpack on you for your journey. You know, like your mum or dad would put a little sandwich in your backpack and send you off. The father puts a little backpack. What was in it? Oh, a piece of the homeland. For the Bible says that he has put eternity in men's hearts. A little piece of the homeland. You might have left the homeland of your father's womb, but the homeland never left you. Amen. Amen. This is eternal love. The everlasting love. Perfect love, people. Cast out all fear. In Jesus' mighty name. Let's give him... Let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, it's, it is dinner time. So, bless God. What I'd like, just come, can we just have, I mean, you know what I'm like with me music. Let's just have a song. 
Yeah, we've got to respond with a song, haven't we? We've got to respond. Let's respond. 